All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, a very warm welcome indeed. Thank you for joining us uh, relatively late in the evening what is a very difficult time at the moment. Um, my name is Tim Robbins. I am a medical registrar and a PhD candidate in the West Midlands of the United Kingdom, and I do diabetes and endocrinology. This session has very kindly been put together by the Society for Endocrinology, SFE, um, with some support and input from the Young Diabetologist and Endocrinologist Forum, YDEF. I really do recommend checking out both of those websites because they've got a whole host of resources for those considering a career in this area. But without meaning to lay things too much, we have three fabulous speakers uh, today who I will introduce in turn. Um, and they will give us career insights and top practical tips uh, for a career in diabetes that will hopefully inspire you. We'll have three sessions. I'll introduce introduce each session um, one at a time. Please do put any questions you have in the chat uh, as we go through. I'll keep all those, I'll moderate them, and then at the end we have a really good length of time to have a detailed discussion and a question answer at the end, but that will come after all three speakers have spoken, but feel free to ask questions at any point. So the first speaker I would like to present is Professor Chowdhury. He's a clinician in the Department of Diabetes and Metabolism at the Royal London Hospital in London. He has a research and a clinical interest in diabetes, particularly um, looking at risk factors around South Asians and diabetic kidney disease. He's authored well over 200 publications, including books on those areas, and he runs a diabetes and metabolism course at Barts, for which some of you may know him already. So first of all, I'd like to introduce Professor Chaji. Thank him for coming and let's listen to his talk. Thank you. Okay, guys, nice to see you uh, and welcome. Uh, I'm just going to share some slides with you shortly and then we'll make a start. Just one minute. Okay. Fingers crossed you can see some slides. Uh, fingers crossed uh, this is going to work. I feel a bit anxious about webinars and, and the technology and so on, but, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, absolutely delighted to, to, to be here. Thanks to the organisers for inviting me. And I've got Amy uh, in the room as well with me. We're going to, uh, she's going to share with you some diabetes technology. But I have been asked to give you a talk uh, for 15 minutes about clinical diabetes. What's it all about? I know many of you have, uh, have been on the endocrine uh, session, um, uh, which was, I think, on Tuesday, and I heard that it was a, a great session. So I hope that we can keep up the diabetes and metabolism end uh, for you as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and cover why I pursued a career in endocrinology and diabetes, why really you should too. You've got to uh, think about this. It's a great career and something that you should think about. Why is the specialty important? Why is it different? What sort of skills you might need to succeed? And then finally, I was asked to give you a, a sort of top tip. And, and I, I decided not to do the DKA HHS type thing uh, uh, that usually is, is, is uh, sort of a, a top tip. What I've decided to do is maybe something more closer to home is thinking about diabetes on the walls, that hyperglycemic patient at night. What do you do? with them. Uh, so we, I thought I'd just give you a, a, a couple of slides on that as well. So let's uh, start with this. So you can see here I'm a, a Villa fan. Uh, and uh, those of you that are from Liverpool, I won't be uh, mentioning the 7-2 scoreline uh, at all. Um, uh, I won't even uh, uh, cross my lips. Uh, but uh, um, but uh, you'll, you'll see here I'm a, a consultant position. I work at the Royal London Hospital in the east end of London in Whitechapel. Uh, and I also do quite a lot of work for the medical school. So I run a metabolism program there. Uh, I'm a Brummie. Uh, so that, that's the only reason for supporting Aston Villa. Uh, uh, and I've, I've uh, sort of born in Birmingham, uh, a university in Birmingham. And I did a lot of my training actually in Birmingham and Manchester. Uh, but I actually came down for personal reasons. My uh, my my uh, sort of uh, uh, father lived in London and became unwell, and I became a consultant. Actually, this is my twentieth year, believe it or not, as a consultant. Uh, it's quite scary to think about that, and I, I'm sure you'd agree it's been a horrendous year, and it's, I, I think it's been the most challenging year uh, for me as a consultant that I've ever known. It's been such a, a difficult year, and running a COVID ward and, and so on has been tr uh, tricky. But uh, but nevertheless, it's it, it's still great to, to to be a consultant diabetologist. I've got a special interest in diabetes and South Asians and diabetes and renal disease. And uh, this, the, the, the reason for sharing this is I, I, I'm sort of, I, a couple of years ago, I turned 50. My wife bought this wonderful car for me, a sports car that I absolutely love and adore and, and uh, you know, drive every week. And I was driving this car uh, 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 probably about two years ago now, uh, at a terrible speed up the M40, uh, and thinking, I was sort of daydreaming, what cars would suit what specialties and and bear with me uh, with this I'm, i I'll, I'll take you uh, take you through what i was uh, uh, my musings uh, during that drive so these are the specialties that i generally have the most contact with uh, and these are the people that i talk to on a daily basis generally uh, in my clinic 
And so I was thinking what car suits what specialty. Well, I'm sure you'd agree a cardiologist has to be a red, blood red Ferrari. They can zoom into the heart attack center, zoom out uh, uh, to, to Harley Street uh, and, you know, waft in and out with their blood red Ferrari. And if a Ferrari is for you, then maybe maybe cardiology might be for you. Uh, but uh, what about a geriatrician? Well, I love geriatricians and I think a classic MGB is perfect for a geriatrician uh, because they, you know, they can keep these classic cars going forever. Uh, you know, a nice old car that they can uh, keep going for a long time uh, usable and, and friendly and so on uh, so yeah I think I think a classic car like that perfect what about a, a GP my G wife's a GP so I have to be very kind to GPs uh, and so I thought a Volvo this is a jack of all trades it's quite a nice car it fits your family it's it, it does everything you want it it's quite fast and stylish and and so on so most of my GP colleagues are, uh, are fast and stylish like this so yeah, I, I think it's a great car for a GP uh, this one's a bit of a, a, a out there isn't it I, my my best friend is a medical ophthalmologist and he bought this car uh, a, a few years ago and I said to him you really need your eyes testing because it's the most ugly car that you can ever imagine uh, so that's the reason for putting that there um, and then uh, and I thought a neurologist would be perfect in a, a classic role so you can see them being chauffeured by their their registrar in and out of the ward they'll come and uh, maybe deign to see a, a patient of yours give a, a, a an opinion ask for a thousand tests and you'd never see them again as they waft away in their classic roles uh, so yeah a neurologist in a, in a, a Rolls Royce perhaps uh, and then nephrologists, well, you know, in the, the gallons of urine that they have to, to wade through, I thought an ampy car. Uh, and for similar reasons, a gastroenterologist, you can see a perfect car for them uh, uh, as well. So, uh, yeah, I, I mean, this is yeah, absolutely ridiculous uh, statements, I, I know. But what I'm trying to get, get at when I've given this sort of illustration to you is that as an endocrinologist or a diabetologist in my clinic, I can be, I can drive all of these cars uh, and I can be a, a neurologist to a podiatrist in my clinic. I have to deal with cardiological, neurological, all sorts of uh, major uh, problems. I, I, many of my patients are getting older and frailer and, and I have to be a, a, a geriatrician as well. So, you know, it's the great thing about being a, a, an endocrinologist, diabetologist, is that you deal with the whole patient. You're not just dealing with one bit of the patient, you're dealing uh, with, with the whole patient. And I, I think that if that sort of suits you, uh, then you should think about this specialty really seriously. So why is diabetes uh, so important? The world's most populated countries, I, I, there's not much scope for chat here, but, but China, India, diabetes. Uh, so those of you that uh, are, have seen this before, you'll be aware that if you put all the patients with diabetes in one place in the world, uh, you'll, uh, you'll uh, make them the third most populated country in the world, uh, preferably not the UK, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of diabetes about. In the UK now, we, when I was a registrar in 1995, we had about a million people with diabetes uh, uh, in the UK. We're now to 4 million. By the middle of this decade, we will be uh, at 5.5 uh, million. So the numbers are growing and growing. And this is why you will never actually be uh, out of a job. There'll be so much uh, work for you to do uh, uh, in diabetes. And diabetes is incredibly important. It's, I mean, it's one of the most important long-term conditions and it contributes to so many different uh, uh, um, pathologies and complications. So many of our patients will develop cardiovascular disease, they develop uh, end-stage renal disease. To, to dialyze someone, as I'm sure you're aware, it costs 30,000 pounds a year to, to put them on dialysis uh, each year. They, do, uh, they, they go blind, uh, they get foot problems. Uh, they also get a cirrhosis, third commonest cause of, of uh, liver disease is diabetes. And actually something that a lot of people are not aware of is diabetes is an independent risk factor for a number of cancers uh, as well. So diabetes is really important. It really has a massive impact on people's lives. So it, it, it reduces your life expectancy. So not only that morbidity that I've shown, your life expectancy reduced anywhere between three and 12 years. So those of you that are in London, you, you're probably familiar with the Jubilee line and this thing about from Westminster to Stratford, you lose one year of your life expectancy every stop along the way of that uh, that uh, tube line. So it's there's huge health inequalities. And so in, in my area of East London, people are dying uh, prematurely uh, by a, a decade or more from this disease. So it's really important we do something about it it's hugely costly it's it's 14 billion a year but the major important thing about that is the the treatment that it's not the treatment that is costly it's the treatment of complications so it's the dialysis the the amputation the heart attack the stroke it's the complications that the uh, the, the costly uh, bit of the treatment 
uh, uh, at the moment. And the other important thing I'd just like to convey is that diabetes isn't just type 1 and type 2. So we just we, we now realize that actually many people are miscoded. Many people have other forms of diabetes. Uh, and so there's, uh, uh, there is actually a, a, a whole sort of area of making a correct diagnosis of diabetes now, genetic and based on phenotype and lots of other uh, um, uh, ways of, of making a diagnosis now um, uh, uh, in, in diabetes. So that's quite an important point to, to bear in mind as well. So what do I do as a consultant diabetologist? Well, I think the, the really important point here is that I don't do routine diabetes clinics. So I don't do sit in a clinic and do lots of annual reviews of, of patients. I, 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 that's just not my role anymore. I used to do that as, uh, 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 maybe a, a decade or so or two ago, but diabetes has very much changed. Di a diabetologist does a specialist uh, uh, work now. So we have specialist roles in type one diabetes, and you're going to hear from Amy shortly about how technology is totally changing the landscape of, of how we manage type 1 diabetes now that type 1 diabetes is 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 uh, by by the time you guys are consultants you will be managing it in a completely different way to the way i've managed it in the last 20 years um, in, in East London, we have one of the largest renal units in in the in Europe, actually, uh, and so I run a, a huge uh, diabetic renal service there. Um, we've also got lots of other uh, uh, um, sort of specialist areas. One of the things that I, I really, the best bit of my week, actually, is, is community liaison. So I work with GPs. I do MDTs with GPs, discussing their, their difficult patients that they're managing. And a, a lot of uh, the engine of diabetes care is now practice nurses and GPs in primary care now. So I work a lot uh, around education. The other thing that you'll, you'll do is you'll offer leadership contribution to an MDT. You'll work with GPs, as I've said, you'll work with public health. You'll do lots and lots of education, huge amounts of uh, education for undergraduates, postgraduates and, and GPs in primary care. And you, you'll liaise with many other specialties uh, in, in uh, specialist clinics uh, uh, as well. So what are the things that attracted me to diabetes? Well, I suppose the, the things when I was reflecting on, uh, on this, when I uh, was writing this talk, it's a huge variety. So, so uh, whilst whilst diabetes is one condition, the caseload is hugely varied and interesting. There's very little routine care. It's outpatients, it's inpatients. There's teaching, research, community facilitation. And we, as diabetologists, are very proud of the fact that we were the first uh, uh, sort of specialty, really, to take on this sort of wider MDT, to, to actually get, get diabetes nurses in, involved in, in diabetes care, to have dietitians, psychologists, uh, podiatrists, and, and a whole team of people working with us to, to, to uh, work uh, in, in diabetes care. So that attracted me. The other thing that attracted me was prevention. Uh, so if actually thinking about trying to do something to stop disease, reduce the risk of complications, prevention of diabetes is feasible now, getting people to go into remission. So there's lots and lots of, of ways of, of working around that uh, 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 area as well. I think that, that perhaps the most important thing for me was using my clinical skills. So I, I love being with patients, talking with patients, taking a history, examining them, interpreting investigations, working with patients uh, to, to develop a, a management plan and, and their carers and, and the, the wider MDT. And I think that's, that's really critical to, to uh, the, where, where we are as, as, as diabetologists is actually working with patients to try and come up with uh, a plan as to how to manage their, their disease. Um, research and innovation is also incredibly important. There's huge amounts of integrated uh, clinical and scientific research the whole thing you'll hear from Amy about technology, that's all come from, from diabetes research. We've got some amazing new drugs in diabetes that we're using now uh, in type 2 diabetes that are really having a massive impact on uh, our patients with diabetes as well. So what sort of skills will you need if you want to succeed in, in endocrinology and diabetes? Well, you, you're going to have to be quality, okay? You're going to have to be a, a high quality clinician, a diagnostician, someone who's got an analytical approach, attention to detail. You're going to have to really have top quality ex, uh, communication skills as well. You're going to have to know how to talk to patients, how to mot motivate them, think about motivational interviewing, how to work with them and get them on board uh, and establish a rapport. You've got to be curious about them. How does diabetes affect their life? Lives. How does diabetes fit into their lives? These are these are going to be the questions that you're going to want to get out of, of uh, yeah, the history that you take. You're going to have to be work, uh, working in a team. You're going to have to be comfortable in asking other team members opinions. You're going to have to say, I'm, I'm not sure what to do here. Can you give me some advice? As a consultant, I do that every day uh, and I, I have no compunction in, in doing that. No problem in doing that at all. Leadership and teaching skills, as I've, I've mentioned as well. 
So summary, why endocrinology and diabetes? Well, I think it's a, a fantastic and varied career. I, I've not uh, regretted a single day of, of coming into this specialty. I've absolutely loved it and I still love it. And uh, I, I'm, I'm still going. I haven't gone through the professional menopause that many of my colleagues are, are going through at the moment. Um, I, uh, the other thing is that there's plenty of jobs. So if you get a, a specialist trainee uh, post, you're likely to become a consultant. That I ha All of my trainees uh, have, have got ex excellent consultant posts uh, um, uh, where they want to be as well. So there's loads and loads of expansion in, in consultant uh, uh, posts uh, in diabetes and endocrinology. There's a diversity of career options. You can do uh, subspecialist work uh, and, and really get into uh, uh, research and, and, and teaching as well. So that's my sort of selling diabetes and endocrinology. And I was asked by the, the organiser to give you one top tip. And I, I thought I'd just share this with you. I, I decided not to do the, the sort of usual uh, uh, diabetic emergencies thing. And I just thought perhaps I'd, I'd take you through this sort of case scenario that perhaps is a bit more closer to home for, for foundation doctors and, and uh, uh, um, core medical, sorry, internal medical trainees. So you're an on-call doctor overnight. Uh, you take a phone call from a nurse in charge of a medical ward to review a 58 year old man with a glucose of 23.2. You're busy, you can't get to see him straight away. Uh, what information from the nurse might help you prioritize whether he needs to be seen urgently? Uh, and again, I know it's difficult to, uh, to, to, to get make this interactive at the moment. So these are sort of things that I think probably I would say you need to, to, to be uh, asking about. What's the new score? Uh, and does he look, uh, what treatment is he on? Has he had his treatment? How well or unwell does he look? Uh, all of these sort of things uh, uh, would be the sort of questions that you might uh, ask the nurse overnight and, and then prioritise your patient. What would you do? Well, I, I suppose one of the things that, that all diabetologists get a little bit sort of agitated or get antibodies about is a, a phone call uh, to a, 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 you know, a junior doctor who says, just give six units of Actrapid and, and, and doesn't do anything else. And, and you know, that sometimes is, is necessary, but it's, it's something that probably we, sh we should be trying to do less of. So we know that uh, inpatients get lots of hyperglycemia. Sometimes they miss their, their, their medications. They're acutely unwell. Um, they get sepsis. So they're, they're having surgery. They're on steroids. So COVID, of course, is, is a, a terribly difficult time with steroids and dexamethasone at the moment. We're having huge huge problems with steroid exacerbated uh, diabetes uh, uh, on the wards at the moment. Many of them may have poor control. That's maybe why they're in hospital. They've developed complications because of chronic poor control. They might be under a, a sort of quite a lot of stress and anxiety. So there's lots of reasons for inpatient hyperglycemia. And I think in this day and age, really, you've got to think uh, to yourself, well, I'm going to have to go and see this patient. You might temporize them by, by giving a, a small dose of insulin and then uh, come back and see them, but you've got to go and see them, I think. Uh, uh, I think it's indefensible not to see a patient with a, a glucose of, of 23 um, uh, in the middle of the night if, if, if a nurse asks you to see them. So we should probably only be using variable rate insulins in, in, in type 2 diabetes if they're particularly unwell, if they're nil by mouth. Um, and occasionally it's acceptable for a short period for glucoses to be that high in the hospital. You know, they're unwell and treatment is being titrated. Try to avoid using those frequent stat doses. And one of the things that I often see is these patients have, have had, you know, five or six days of, of the, this sort of same issue and nothing's been done. No one's been called. Every, every, uh, can, uh, every uh, hospital really should have an inpatient diabetes team now. So call for help, get, get them to see them in the clear light of day and give you some advice about uh, managing them. Uh, this doesn't project terribly well, but this was a, a, an article that I wrote in the BMJ, myself and, and colleagues wrote in the BMJ a little while ago as a practice pointer. Uh, and I'll try and get the, the article and maybe put it in the chat for you. Uh, just to look at a, a sort of pathway to, to manage your patient uh, who's got a high blood glucose uh, uh, on the ward and, and what you should consider doing uh, in, in that circumstance. Uh, so I'll try and share that with you uh, in, the, uh, in the chat. I'm going to leave it there uh, and over to you, Tim. That was uh, a fantastic and a whistle-stop tour. So thank you so much, Prof Chowdhury. Um, the next speaker um, we have also works in, in London at the Barts Health Centre and is Amy Schollich. She is the type 1 diabetes and insulin pump diabetes specialist nurse there. She's authored and co-authored a, a wide range of PubMed indexed articles and particularly including those focused on diabetes anxiety and uh, monitoring um, monitoring related anxiety. So from the DSM perspective, um, hopefully Amy can follow up with the presentation now. Thank you. I'm just setting up things for Amy, so it won't be one moment.
while Prof Charger is doing that, don't forget to ask any questions you have in the chat and we'll bring them up at the end. So. Okay, Tim, uh, uh, oh, sorry. Tim, can you hear us and see us? Looks perfect. Okay. Hi everybody, my name is Amy Shlomovitz. So I am the lead type one and insulin pump diabetes specialist nurse for Barts Health NHS Trust. And I'm delighted to talk to you about my favorite topic, which is um, technology and type one diabetes. So the aims is to provide a brief overview of the impressive technology available, which includes the Freestyle Libra flash glucose monitoring system and new devices associated with it, continuous glucose monitoring, some new insulin pens and insulin pumps. So glucose meters, the first glucose meter on the market, I believe was in 1971, as you can see in the top left corner called AIMS. And as you can see, there's now a lot more glucose meters available on the market. There's about 40, I believe, currently. People with type one diabetes, we ask them quite a lot. We ask them to test their blood glucose you know, sometimes four times a day, sometimes they're doing it much more, four to eight or 10 times a day, which actually can be quite, you know, a, a tall order and quite painful for them. Some people forget to, to test their blood glucose or, or they're fearful of the result. Um, so to prick their finger, devices have also changed. Um, in 1986, the, um, the first Lancet device that came out was called the Autolet aka la guillotine and as you can see it would have been quite painful to prick your finger with that you know up to eight eight times a day so it's definitely improved but still um it, it's um not a nice thing for someone to have to do however now we've got something very new called the freestyle libra system where the person rather than pricking their finger can scan their glucose and one of the wonderful things about the Libra is the person can scan their, to get their glucose over a winter coat. The parent can scan the child in the middle of the night without having to prick their finger. So it, as corny as it sounds, it's quite life changing for a lot of our type ones to be able to have this device. So it's called the, the Freestyle Libra. It's a new category in glucose monitoring and it comes with a Libra reader, a sensor and software that the person can download. One of the wonderful things about the Libra is not only does it give the person a glucose reading, but the arrows are very informative. So as you can see, someone could have a glucose of 6.2 and it's rising, but perhaps they're about to go to the gym. So they think, actually, that's fine. I can leave that glucose. I'm quite comfortable to go to the gym with a glucose of 6.2. However, if that person had a glucose of 6.2 with an arrow going down, they might change their management and actually think, oh, I need some fast acting carbohydrates or some gels so I don't have a hypo. So people with type one diabetes tell me how wonderful these arrows are, how, how informative um, that it tells you the, um, the, the change in glucose. So just some basics about the Freestyle Libra. It can be used with a reader, as I mentioned, or a uh, compatible smartphone. It's used by many thousands of people in 44 countries, I believe. It measures the glucose in the tissues, so in the interstitial fluid, um, and it's about 15 minutes behind capillary glucose. It's licensed only for use on the arm, and the sensor stores data for eight hours, and it's worn for 14 days. And it takes a reading every 15 minutes, so that's 96 readings per day. But the person at any time can actively scan and get additional readings, but they must scan the sensor every eight hours in order to get a continuous trace because it only stores data for, for eight hours. It's quite expensive, so it's a roughly 50 pounds that the person can get privately, or if they fulfill certain Pan London or NHS England guide, guidelines, um, they can get it on prescription. The data automatically uploads to something called LibreView. So especially during COVID and all our, we've been doing a lot of virtual 
uh, consultations for our relatively stable people with type one. Um, it's just really improved the consultation that the person can upload to Libre and we can see their data at any time that they need us to, to help them. There's good evidence for this in studies with reduction in HbA1c and hyperreduction, and more recently some evidence about reduction in DKA for those that are using the Libra device. And I think as doctors, you'll probably, you might have seen this already on the wards, but a lot of our type ones on the wards um, are using it. Um, in addition to the nurse, you know, as per trust policy, having to, to check their, um, their, to do a finger prick reading. So you'll probably see this on the wards. At the moment, they don't need to calibrate it and there's no high or glucose alarms currently, but some people really want the low and high glucose alarms. So what they do is they've bought specific devices. These devices aren't CE marked and they're not regulated. So they're off label devices but they actually attach to the Freestyle Libra and it provides low and high glucose alarms. So we do have people turning up to clinic with all these new devices. And recently in the last few weeks, I heard that there's a new one called the bubble. So I've had to quickly upskill. So that's really exciting in diabetes that we're learning a lot from our type ones um, about, about what they're learning from different forums. But these devices called Blucon, Meow Meow, Meow Meow 2 and the bubble are very clever. It's not something that we actively promote because they're not, um, they're not tried and tested devices. But also some people are actually using the de these devices with the Libra, with insulin pumps, and then the insulin is automatically um, titrated depending on their, their glucose levels. So it's called DIY, do-it-yourself looping, which is becoming more popular around the world. So the Libra 2 and the Libra 3 are new systems that are coming to the UK. So the Libra 2, we're desperately awaiting its arrival. It's been in Germany for about a year. Bluetooth technology and the main improvement is that it does have these low and high glucose alarms to alert the person, for example, if they're, they're low overnight. But the person still needs to scan actively to, um, to receive these alarms every eight hours. The Libra 3 just received its CE mark this month and it has, as well as the alarms, it's much smaller and thinner and there's no more scanning. And I've been told that it connects to two different types of insulin pumps, or well, that's the hope in the near future, the Omnipod and the Tandem insulin pump. So moving on to something a bit more superior, we have continuous glucose monitoring um, called CGM. This has been around much longer. So it's been around since 2008 in the UK. It has better accuracy than the, the Freestyle Libra. Um, we measure accuracy by something called MARD, which is mean absolute relative difference. So the lower the accuracy, the lower the percentage, the better. So anything below 10% has some um, good accuracy. Um, and the, the CGM does have better accuracy than the, the Libra. But it gives a reading every five minutes. So 288 readings a day, which is actually quite remarkable. And there's lots of different CGM systems that are available with different sensors lasting seven days, 10 days. And we actually have a six monthly implantable um, sensor called Eversense. So it measures the glucose in the interstitial fluid as well. And it's behind about 10 minutes, but it's actually really expensive. So a lot of people in the UK do have to self fund um, CGM. There's different uses for CGM. So historically we used to use it quite often in clinic for diagnostic purposes, um, where the person would come in, be fitted with the, the blinded CGM, go away for a week, not see the results. So just go about their usual, their usual treatment and management of their diabetes. Then they'll come back and they will, um, we will download it for them. There's also standalone CGM. So people who are on multiple daily injections. So people who um, have injections also want the benefit of having the CGM and all the advantages. But also the third option is that actually it can communicate with an insulin pump. So it has the high and low glucose alarms and it connects to the pump. So it is more superior than, than the Libra. And as you can see here in this diagram, I quite like this diagram. If you imagine someone is just checking their blood glucose four times a day, as shown with the red circles, so they're getting four, four points of, of data during the day. As compared to someone who's using CGM, which to me is like a, a CCTV trace. So you, you can see the 288 readings there plotted out. So the person who uses just the finger prick method 
and doesn't have access to CGM won't see the spike as you can see in the morning about nine o'clock probably after breakfast and the spike after evening meal so that they would be completely oblivious to all that extra information. So just to, just to highlight, just in pictures, you can see the blinded CGM. The first system looks quite um, backwards now when we look at the, the blinded CGM that, that came out 12 years ago. Um, the middle is the, the MDI, the standalone CGM, and the CGM with pump. So there is a future CGM coming, I hear, called Dexcom G7, called Verily. It's a 14-day sensor. And with an Apple phone, you can say, Siri, what's my glucose? Um, and Siri will tell you what your blood glucose is, which I think is quite remarkable. It can have up to 10 followers. So it can include parents, family members, school teachers. And there is some evidence I've heard that the more followers the person has, the better diabetes control. You can imagine a parent saying, why did you eat that snack at lunchtime? Um, and also the information will go directly to a, a smart watch. So just briefly with insulin pens, as you can see, Banting and Best discovered insulin in 1922 in the first, um, the first um, glass syringe um, we had, the person had to sterilize it between use and it was quite sharp and painful, I've been told. Um, then we got the violin and, and syringe and then in 1985, we got insulin pens. And now in the past few years, we've had um, memory pens and half unit pens. So the memory pen is very clever. It will tell the person, for example, they gave 5.5 units of insulin three hours ago. So especially for some older adults that might forget if, they, if they've had insulin or not, they can use a memory pen. So that is available at the moment. What is coming that we don't have yet, but it is available in the US, is downloadable pens. So they are equipped with NFC technology, so they can be scanned um, from, the information from the pen can be scanned onto a phone or a computer. It can hold 800 injection doses with a five-year battery life, um, and it will tell the person as well when they last gave a dose um, and the amount of the dose as well, and it will work with many apps. And as you can see in the picture at the bottom, in a Swedish pilot, the pens were downloaded in the healthcare provider's office using a kiosk, and the data provided showed not only injection history, but some other glucose and other diabetes information that was used in a, in a study. So moving on to insulin pumps, my probably favorite thing to talk about. Um, as you can see, I love this slide. Um, this um, picture of Dr. Arnold Krish developing the very first insulin pump, I believe in 1963, and it was called the backpack. Can you imagine having to um, ask someone wear this device on their back? But as you can see, pumps have, have improved and got a lot smaller over the years. So the current insulin pump landscape, we have about eight different types of pumps in the UK. At Bart's Health, we're a very large, um, quite a large pump centre. We've got about 370 people on all the different types of pumps because we're quite keen to offer choice. Um, and you probably will see, if you've not already seen, people on the wards with, um, with these pumps. If I'm to think of my top tip in, um, in diabetes would be that the very first time I saw a person on pump, was about 15 years ago when I worked at a, a previous hospital and I had to go up and review a, an American lady on a pump who came in for, a, I can't remember the reason that she came in at the time. But I was absolutely petrified to go and visit this lady because I felt like a, a fraud. I had no knowledge of what an insulin pump was. And she probably spent an hour showing me her pump. And from that day, I, I felt much more relieved about technology just because um, the person with, with type one can really tell you a lot about about their devices so I would just say ask ask the patient on the ward get them to show you their device um, and how it works so um, insulin pumps is also known as um, CSII continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion and I think it's the best tool that we've got to mimic the pancreas of someone without type 1 diabetes um, the components include a cannula, the tubing, which um, oh, the cannula can be plastic or metal. Um, I think in pregnancy, it's really good that the person uses a metal cannula. So it's not going to not going to bend. Sometimes the plastic cannulas can kink. 
but you don't want that to happen in pregnancy where the, the baby is getting high, high glucose when it shouldn't be. And tubing, um, there's an insulin reservoir and the pump. And like injections, they can place the cannula on the abdomen, thighs, buttocks or arms. But the big difference is that with a pump, it is rapid acting insulin only. So a Pedra, Humalog, Nova Rapid, Fiasp, the four rapid acting insulins go into the pump and any pump can use those insulins. But the rapid acting insulin now is doing two jobs. It is replacing the job of the, the, the background insulin, the basal, so the person would no longer be on Traceva or Levomir or Lantus. So it's doing two jobs. And that rapid acting insulin is actually giving them each hour a basal rate, and it can be a different basal rate every hour. But also when they go to eat something, the same rapid acting insulin, um, they, can, they can give it at the time that they eat for the carbohydrates they're about to eat. And also if their glucose is high, they can give a correction as well. So this is just to show you that actually somebody could have 24 different hourly basal rates. So the pump is really clever. So for someone that might have something called dawn phenomenon, where the glucose levels are in some people higher in the early hours of the morning, often due to growth hormone and cortisol, le cortisol levels interacting with the, the action of insulin, they might need a higher amount of insulin at that time. And with insulin pens, say Levomir or Lantus, you can't just change the dose at a particular time. Whereas a pump, as you can see, at 4 a.m., 5 a.m., 6 a.m., on this, on this chart, that the person is on a higher amount of insulin per hour than, than say, during, during lunchtime. So this is called a basal program. Normally, when we start someone on pump, we just start with one flat basal of maybe a one unit per hour or a half a unit per hour. But eventually, they might need four or so different um, settings throughout the day. And they can also have different programs. So if it's someone with type 1 who's a doctor who's working on the wards, they can have a different night shift um, basal program to, to, um, to, to daytime and also a different skiing program or menstruation program. So they can have different programs. So it's so much more flexible than pens. So the advantages, I've, I've mentioned some already, but the precision as well is quite amazing. The person can have as little as one fortieth of a unit of insulin um, versus with a pen, a half a unit. It's much more reliable because insulin is delivered much more slower. The pump also stores the history so the person will remember. if They can check if they've, they've given insulin um, at what time. Also, I had an 84-year-old lady on a pump at my, one of my previous hospitals, and she, the, the, the best thing for her was that she didn't have to give injections anymore. So she used to snack a lot throughout the day, and she could just give, her, um, give the insulin via the pump. There's less insulin stacking, so because the pump remembers when the person's given a correction dose, maybe for a high glucose. So it, won't, it will prevent them from giving too many extra correction doses. There's also an inbuilt calculator. So the pump will work out how much insulin the person will need. That's how many carbohydrates they've eaten. You can also do some clever bolus delivery types at mealtimes. So they can give a standard bolus, which will go through within a few minutes. But the person can also give something called a combination bolus, where something like a pizza, a really fatty meal or a curry, where the fat of that food delays the release of glucose into the bloodstream, the person can give a split bolus. So they can give, for example, 70% of the bolus up front and then 30% over two hours or four hours or even up to eight hours. Um, so it's absolutely really clever. And if they decide that they're not going to need the other part of the bolus, they can cancel it at any time. So very useful. So now combining pump and sensor, so pump and CGM. So Medtronic brought out in 2015, which was very exciting, a um, glucose sensor which um, talked to the pump. So when combined, as well as getting the high and low alerts, the person's insulin can automatically be suspended if the blood glucose level is approaching a low glucose. So it's called smart guard technology and it can suspend the insulin for a minimum of 30 minutes to a maximum of two hours while the person recovers from their near hypo or their hypo. It's not a magic bullet so that it can prevent roughly 80% of hypos, but not always all hypos. Some hypos just come on very fast for, for, for many different reasons. But this system 
the low glucose suspend system, the smart guard system. Um, it just deals with the low glucose automatically, but not doesn't, it doesn't deal with the high glucose. So if the person's glucose is high, they have to give a correction themselves. But moving one step further, we've now got the closed loop system or the Medtronic Hybrid 670 closed loop system, which arrived in the UK last year. And luckily, we were one of the first centres to be able to use it because I, I begged with, with some of my diabetes doctor colleagues, we begged to, to get this system up and running with people on it. So we've got about 20, 25 people using the system. Um, so it's the first world, the, the world's first hybrid closed loop system and it can automatically deal with high glucose and low glucose so what happens is the sensor feedbacks the the glucose levels to the pump and the insulin basal rate is automatically adjusted to increase or decrease insulin amount so every five minutes the basal will be increased depending on the blood glucose level and the pump aims to keep the person's glucose level fixed to 6.7 and that can't be moved. So that does actually irritate some people where they actually want tighter control. Um, maybe in pregnancy, they want a slightly lower glucose than 6.7, but it, 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 um, it, is, it is generally um, well received. Um, it's still hands-on, so the person still needs at meal times to input their carbohydrates and, and be really accurate with their carb counting. So knowing how much insulin they need for, for the food. And it's been based on many algorithms that has been developed over the years. So the wonderful thing about all this data that I mentioned, it can be downloaded in clinic. So glucose meters, Libra, um, insulin pumps can all be downloaded either to LibreView or to something called Diasend, which is used um, we've used it for quite a few years now and it's just made the clinic consultation with the person with diabetes so much more meaningful and the person with type 1 really often wants to look at the data and um, usually they just go about their day-to-day -day business treat the high glucose or the low glucose but don't really think to look for patterns so it's really clever for for us as clinicians that we can look for patterns we can look at the data before we call the person or bring them into clinic just so we can um, have an idea of what's going on before they come in, but we can, we can look at it together. So very quickly, contraindications to use um, a pump in a hospital. So it's usually best for the person to self-manage their diabetes, except if they're unable um, or if they're unconscious, obviously, or in DKA, we don't advise that they are on pump, or if their surgery is longer than, than two hours, it's advisable to switch to variable rate insulin infusion, or perhaps if the anaesthetist feels that they aren't confident to have the person on pump, then that's, that's a very um, understandable reason to switch to variable rate. If the person's at risk of self-harm or suicide, or if the staff don't feel that they, um, the ongoing use of the pump is in the best interest of the person, or perhaps the, pump, uh, the person could be on holiday and they get admitted and they don't have all their pump supplies with them, so then they'd need to go back to, to pens um, in hospital or if the person doesn't want to carry on using the pump in hospital. Some women who have just delivered their baby, they'd prefer to be on variable rate and not have to think about it while they're um, recovering from their cesarean section or, or, um, or giving birth. So um, as well as my top tip about talk to the person, um, in your local hospital, obviously just follow their own policy for insulin pumps um, as inpatients or the, the trust insulin safety policy but also some wonderful resources made by the, um, the ABCD. Uh, the there's two best practice guides, or that, there's actually four best practice guides, but the two most relevant to this talk is as a clinical guide for adult diabetes services. So if you're wondering, okay, I'm gonna put a person on pump, how much insulin will they need? It will give you all the calculations. Or the second guide is for hospitalized patients. So if you're thinking, can that person wear an MRI have an MRI and wear a pump or they're about to deliver a baby can the pump stay on any of those questions are all answered in these guides so they're really um, really useful I look at them regularly even though I've read them so many times I often still refer to them just some resources so think like a pancreas is, is um, a, a great resource written by an exercise physiologist in the states who has type 1 diabetes um, Bright Spots and Landmines is another good book and other, other organisations, so Diabetes UK and Type 1 D Exchange and diabetes.co.uk have lots of information on technology. So in summary, um, 
I think there's so much exciting um, technology in, in, in type 1 diabetes, such as the Freestyle Libra, downloadable pens, CGM and insulin pumps. All this data can be downloaded so we can discuss it with the person with, with diabetes. And all of this technology, the main purpose of this technology is just to improve their diabetes control and try to help reduce their burden of living with um, type 1 diabetes and, and, and reduce their diabetes distress. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you so much, Amy, for what was a, a really comprehensive presentation. Um, our next speaker is um, Prof. Abdurani, a senior lecturer in metabolic endocrinology and obesity medicine at the University of Birmingham. He has a broad range of national and, I believe, now international roles in obesity, sleep medicine, and lipid metabolism, and he's contributed to national and international guideline groups. He's published very widely and is well known for his uh, prominence and very useful contributions on Twitter. So if you're on Twitter, find Abturani and follow him and you'll learn an awful lot. So I'll hand over to Abd and, as I say, as many questions as possible in the chat. Thanks very much. Right. Hello, everyone. And a uh, great pleasure to be with you here, especially after uh, what probably would have been a very long day for uh, most of you. Uh, Tim, can I just ask you a question? Um, how much time do I have, uh, considering the uh, scale, just so I can... If we go for about 10 minutes, I think that should yeah. be good. Um... That's fine. Right, so as Tim said, so uh, I am a senior lecturer in metabolic endocrinology and obesity medicine at the University of Birmingham. I am also an honorary consultant in endocrinology, diabetes, and weight management at the University Hospitals of Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. I... I am a trustee of the Association for the Study of Obesity UK, and I lead their Clinical Practice and Obesity Management Committee. I also sit on the All-Party uh, Parliamentary Group for Obesity, uh, on the Strategic Council for the All-Party Parliamentary Group for Obesity. And as well as, the, as well as these roles, I am the lead for translational research in the Center for Diabetes and Endocrinology uh, and Metabolism in Birmingham Health Partners. Uh, and the reason why I've said all that, uh, not because I just want to boost about the titles I have, is actually just to highlight that one of the really fun part of my job is that I deal with so many different people in so many, in so many different hats and in so many different roles, which really keeps me entertained. It keeps life a little bit uh, far less boring, much less predictable. And the challenges that we have from uh, the front door uh, up to policy level at the national level uh, and anything in between. So it's quite an exciting role, uh, role to do and I'm very privileged and lucky to be able to do these roles. Uh, so what I do clinically, I, um, considering obviously uh, I'm an academic, so I'm a, on a 50%, I only spend 50% of my time doing clinical practice. The other 50 is the rest of my life, which is the academia and the policy work and the teaching. The 50% clinical, I focus my clinical efforts on obesity-related uh, clinical services. So I do weight management clinics. I do specialist weight management clinic, for example, managing people post-bariatric surgery or managing people who require rapid weight loss. I do specialist clinic in diabetes and neuropathy. So this is a clinic that deals with uh, a variety of neuropathy-related problems or nerve damage-related problems uh, that are all related to diabetes. And I was asked to give you some top tip at the end of, uh, of my talk about diabetic foot as well, uh, uh, or diabetic neuropathy, uh, as well as about uh, obesity. And I will do that towards the end. I also do weight management clinics uh, related to other endocrine conditions, such as polycystic ovarian syndrome, craniopharyngiomas, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So my clinical role, although it is very focused around obesity, and diabetic neuropathy, which is a highly specialized area. Uh, if you look at it, you'll see that actually it's quite varied role. I, I deal with all sorts of things from hyperlipidemia to hypertension to cardiovascular disease to sleep apnea uh, and, and manage their people diabetes as well as managing their neuropathic pain or gastroparesis uh, or other neuropathic related or bacterial overgrowth or gastrointestinal symptoms. So it's, it's, it's really what, what I love about the job is having this role which allows me to, as, my, as, as the Professor Chowdhury mentioned in his first talk, is you can drive all these nice cars in, 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 in having our job, in our role. We really do a lot of different specialities under one heading. 
And it's important to be able to deliver that type of quality of care to patients. You need to have that knowledge, that broad knowledge to be able to deliver that type of care to the patient. So how did I end up where I am? Um, so the first thing to say, I'm, I'm originally not from the UK. I did my degree uh, in my uh, home country, which is in Syria. Uh, I was a graduate from a university called Aleppo University. I, I finished uh, and graduated in September 1998. After that, I came to the UK. Uh, at that time, there were two options for me in, in terms of specialization, either to come to the UK or go to the US. And what brought me to the UK at the time was the very strong uh, and very uh, um, and the high quality training program in the UK for general medicine. So actually what brought me here was this really general medicine component, which is very strong in the UK, very weak in the US, uh, but I loved it. And I enjoyed my general internal medicine, although sadly I don't do much of it anymore, anymore because of my all other work commitments. Uh, general medicine makes it difficult to have commitments outside the hospital. And because I do have a lot of roles out, outside the hospital, general medicine was slightly difficult to manage. But otherwise, actually what brought me to the UK was the general internal medicine. So I was clear as a medical student that I wanted to do medicine. So that, that was clear. Now, what, what branch of medicine, that was less clear. When I did my junior years, I um, was thinking more about uh, three main specialties. So I did my junior years and I thought, I like cardiology, I like gastroenterology, uh, I like uh, endocrine diabetes, and a little bit I like respiratory medicine. So how, do we, how am I going to decide and what will make me uh, choose one over the other? During that time, our training was a little bit probably more flexible than in your days. So I took uh, standalone jobs after I finished my senior house officer training. I did six months of, of um, uh, a middle grade between senior house officer and the registrar in a way, uh, where I actually did all these specialties. And I was very clear by the end of that period that I definitely want diabetes endocrinology. And the reason why I wanted that compared to all the other, uh, other uh, specialties is because I felt it's where I really fit most. I can manage cardiovascular disease risk factors. I can make a big difference to people's lives. I will be at the center of care of the multidisciplinary care of the team and the care is very multidisciplinary. You need to have a very strong background in biochemistry and understanding your physiology to do endocrine and diabetes. And I absolutely love that bit. Uh, and also it allowed me to continue with general internal medicine, which I loved. Uh, I liked different bits of each specialty. So in each one of these specialties, I mentioned there were certain bits which I thought, yeah, I probably like, but I need to think about the total specialty, not that bit. And, and, and as an interesting point, just to uh, tell people um, this uh, story, when I was a medical student, there were certain conditions to uh, caught my attention uh, in the curriculum. So when we studied about polycystic ovarian syndrome, I really found that condition uh, fascinating. It wasn't even called polycystic ovarian syndrome at the time. It's called, it used to be called Stein-Leventhal syndrome. Um, and I think that name probably has completely disappeared from the literature now. I was also fascinated by another condition, which is called non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And I was also fascinated by obstructive sleep apnea. Now, at the time, it didn't transpire to my mind that actually all these three conditions can be in one specialty. So that was part of the reason why I was thinking maybe cardiology, maybe endocrinology, maybe gastro, so I can do a bit of liver, the respiratory, I really like the sleep apnea stuff. And as I grew older and obviously started learning more, the common de denominator amongst all of these was obesity. Uh, so, so the more and more I looked into obesity, I found it, well, actually that's probably what I really want to do. Um, and I ended up doing obesity uh, eventually after I did endocrine and diabetes uh, because it really satisfied me in terms of where my mind curiosity is. It also satisfied me because you can make a big difference to people's life in an area which is really done very badly. Um, and I probably take, uh, talk about this in five minutes time about how we can improve what we are doing with people with obesity. So eventually I ended up doing all my research and, and, and that's part of the, the, the fun in my job and in, my, in this specialty is that while I'm a diabetologist, endocrinologist, actually what I'm really well known in terms of research, for example, is sleep apnea and sleep related disorder, as well as obesity research, as well as uh, diabetic neuropathy research. So you can see that I really have a lot of um, uh, varied roles and a lot of varied skills that I need to deal with and multiple different areas. So I'm certainly not bored. I can assure you of that. Uh, every day brings a new challenge, brings a new interesting data, brings new interesting uh, clinical conundrum to solve uh, and to help people. The other bit about the specialty, which is uh, also is very fascinating, 
is that it requires a lot of people skill. And I think that was also mentioned by Prof Chowdhury. So absolutely key to the specialty is people skill. So yes, on the endocrine side, you've got usually a diagnostic challenge, which requires, which requires certain biochemical testing and imaging to reach the conclusion. On the obesity side, usually the diagnosis is clear that the person has obesity. So I don't think that uh, that is a complicated issue. Yes, there is a little bit of uh, detective work to understand why they have obesity. Uh, but what comes down to it is building the strong relationship with the patient, the strong doctor relationship, and using the motivational interviewing and behavioral change techniques to try to help people manage their weight uh, and achieve the weight losses and the better health uh, and the quality of life that they need. And the same thing applies with diabetes, because in diabetes as well, uh, managing pain, for example, in the painful neuropathy clinic requires a very strong doctor-patient relationship, and managing people glycemic control requires a very strong doctor-patient relationship in order to be able to help people. And uh, as I said, key to this is motivational interviewing and behavioral intervention techniques. Uh, and, and because I like to talk to people and I'm a people person, I, I like to discuss and I like to talk, I found that really suits me. Uh, and I still enjoy it up till now. I really don't get bored at all in my clinic. Uh, in fact, my clinics always run late because I just talk too much. But nonetheless, it's useful talk. It's not just random talk. It's something to help our people uh, and help our patients. So that's how I ended up here. I mean, part of, again, part of it was uh, during my training. How did I end up being an academic? I think it's probably worth also mentioning. So I was a full-time clinician till 2000 and 2007, so or the end of 2006. At that time, I was in the middle of my SPR training. And one of the things that happened to me at the time is during my training, I kept a very active uh, profile in my training. So I did lots of audits. I did as many presentations as I can do. I did as many projects as I can do. And I never wasted a chance to publish a paper or a letter somewhere or with someone else collaborating. So I was very active in my um, uh, SPR training years, but then I was still thinking, how am I going to be different at the end of my training? I.e., when I want to go and get a job, and at the time, the job opportunities were far less than now. So that's actually something improved over the years. But basically, my question to myself was, if I finish and say, tell people I've attended X amount of clinics in this and this and that, and I've covered all the specialty, and I'm a very competent clinician, why would they give me the job over the person B or person C? So I wanted to do something different. So I, the first step was I did a master's degree at the time uh, on top of my clinical job. It was a, a modular, so it wasn't research-based. But there I've learned a lot about statistics and research methodology, which really inspired me. Uh, and I, it really, I, I really loved it. So the next step was after I finished my uh, specialist training job in Stoke-on-Trent, um, uh, I decided that maybe I need to try to find out whether I can do more of an academic career. So I took a teaching job, a full-time teaching job at the university, uh, at Warwick University. So this was actually quite fun because nobody cares where you are. They only care about where you are when you go and give the lecture. Otherwise, you could be wandering anywhere in the globe. So, uh, and I really enjoyed the relaxing life. Uh, it was much less money, of course, than a clinician. Uh, but it also allowed me the time to go and do the specialist clinics that I wanted to do. So at the time I did obesity, I did lipid, I did polycystic ovarian syndrome, uh, and I did all the other things related to obesity, which I do now. Uh, and that even made me love the specialty even more. After that, I was clear that probably I really would like to stay in academia because in academia, what happened that you not only see clinicians, not only see patients, not only see management, but you also see basic scientists. Uh, and so, and these are a different group of people that you don't deal usually with. And one of the advantages of my role is, uh, is I talk with, to a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds, and hence I have a lot of hats to wear. But also it means that I have to talk the same thing probably in many different ways to make it accessible to those very different people, which I'm communicating with. And it makes my, my job very varied. So it could be policy, it could be clinical care, it could be management, it could be research oriented, it could be grants, it could be examining people. So for example, if I, if, if I tell you what I've done today and yesterday, you'll find that you know, it was from a remote clinic to examining a PhD, to giving two uh, online talks, uh, to uh, give a lecture, to have a chat with collaborators about a grant. Uh, and that was just in the, in, in, in the last one or two days, apart from answering my emails. So it's really, I really have a very varied role, which I really enjoy and keeps me entertained. 
uh, after when I when I did the clean, the academic job, so there was a clinical lecture job advice, advertised in the University of Birmingham. I said, let's give it a go. I was lucky to get that job, and then my academic career progressed from there. The first major highlight was that I was awarded an NIHR research training fellowship in 2008, which during via which I did my PhD, which was in sleep apnea and diabetes. Um, again, that allowed me to expand my profile and started to getting invites to do talks and you start meeting people and collaborators in different countries in the globe. And then you see how people are doing things differently to what we are doing. And that gives you a lot of learning and you say, well, actually that looks better. Why can't we apply it? And then you bring it back here and then you apply it here and it works and people think you are a genius and actually there's nothing genius about it. You just were talking to people and learning from other experiences. Uh, so that, that gave me uh, that the PhD. After the PhD, I continued in academia. I stayed in Birmingham. Then I was awarded another NIHR research training fellowship. Uh, not, sorry, not the research training fellowship, NIHR clinician scientist fellowship, which I finished last year. And now I'm thinking about what my next uh, step in my career progression is going to be. Uh, and I haven't decided that yet, but we are applying for multiple grants that will uh, hopefully allow us to do more research with direct results of uh, on patient's care and patient benefit. Um, and if you ask me what were my career highlights, I would say, is doing the mixed job academic and the clinical is really, really um, a very privileged position because in the hospital, what makes me distinguished from my colleagues is my academic hat. And in the university, what makes me distinguished amongst my colleagues is actually my clinical hat. So you can see how both roles can complement themselves. And that's obviously allowed me the chance to have many highlights in my career, which I absolutely enjoyed, including being awarded, for example, uh, the Young Investigator Award from the American Academy of Sleep Medicine for my research in sleep apnea and type 2 diabetes. Uh, and, you know, it's absolute privilege and, and pleasure. You know, you get the special invite to go to that ceremony to present your work and get the award amongst people who you've never met and you, you probably will never meet. You know, they are all sleep specialists in, in, the, uh, in the U.S., uh, and you sit in that room and obviously full of people who are just here to listen about the work that you've done and, 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 and give you the award. Uh, another highlight was where both my fellowships from NIHR, uh, which are, uh, I'm very lucky to have because they are extremely highly competitive um, and about six of them are awarded per year for, in the UK. So I was very lucky to have those, but they helped me build up my career. Getting invited to speak in the international meetings is very highlight is a big highlight, uh, which Eventually, it's more exciting, but actually, it never gets dull. It keeps happening, and every time you, I find it a new challenge. So, um, whether it's the American Diabetes Association or the American Endocrine Meeting or the local meetings in the Society for Endocrinology, Diabetes UK, and it also helps you to see the globe. So, I've traveled to many countries around the globe. I've delivered more than 100 invited talks up till now. Uh, the furthest place I've been is Indonesia. I haven't been to Australia yet. And on the other side was the uh, western coast of the U.S. And without, uh, if it wasn't for COVID, I would have been this month in South America uh, on an invited tour to deliver several talks in multiple countries. Um, uh, and again, that give you, give you a bit of fun. Uh, not a lot of fun because a lot of these places you just visit literally airport, hotel, lecture, back to the hotel, back to the airport. Uh, but again, it gives you lots of cultures, you, you see other people, how they are thinking, and you really develop very, very big, wide collaborations that enhance your skills and uh, help you when you come back home with lots of bright ideas and uh, new uh, uh, initiatives. It also helps you know super specialists. So we, we, we are all specialists, but there is always areas in our specialties which we are not necessarily the best in the world in. Uh, and then by knowing those super specialists, I really can't get my answer very quickly. So I've seen a patient in the clinic which has got a, a, a rare neuropathy syndrome, and I wasn't sure exactly what is the best way to deal with it. So I, all what I had is to text one of my senior experts in, in Michigan. I got a response in two minutes from the World Authority about this condition. And here you go. I know exactly what I'm doing now. So, uh, and, and that happens uh, quite often when we deal with rare stuff. Um, no one has enough experience in rare stuff apart from one or two globally who really see only this as a career. Um, and knowing them is makes it very easy to get the right answer. So I'll go to my tips so I can stop talking. I can talk forever, as you can see. Um, top tip about obesity and top tip about feet or neuropathy. I think my top tip about obesity is if you want to do obesity as a specialty, you need to leave all the prejudice you had in the whole, whole your life about obesity behind. 
So anything you've heard in the media about people eating too much, not moving enough, laziness, greediness, uh, lack of willpower, you just need to be, leave it be out behind you outside the clinic door. And you need to sit with the patient with a very open mind, use very respectful, non-judgmental, not stigmatizing language. And I was a party to the language matter guidelines about obesity, which you can see it was published earlier this year. You can find it easily on PubMed. So you really need to know how to start talking about obesity to people in a very, very, very non-judgmental manner and matter. Uh, otherwise, you lose the patient very quickly and you will never develop that rapport. And people, who, when they come to the obesity clinic, they actually tell us some of their most intimate facts that they don't declare to anybody. And that can only happen when the relationship between you and the patient reach that very high level that they feel comfortable to share those facts with you. Now, I mentioned about obesity is one of the things about obesity that while the diagnosis is clear, people have obesity, you only need to look at them, measure their waist and ask them to step on a scale and you've got the diagnosis. What is actually more challenging here is knowing the underlying cause of the diagnosis. So why does the person have obesity? And that can sometimes take months to figure out of discussions because there may be behavioral issues, psychological issue, monetary issue, uh, medical problems, hormonal problems, genetic problems, uh, or a combination of all these. So trying to figure out which one actually contributing most to the patient and sometimes solving the patient problem is not medical. So for example, in one, on one of my patients transpired, for example, that the patient main problem that she eats overnight, the reason why she eats overnight because she feels scared, because when she was a child, she was a, a, a thief, entered their house overnight and abused the patient. And now she is married to a person who actually works overnight, leaving her at night on her own. So she eats overnight. So when we managed to figure out that this is the problem, with the help of the psychologist, and we talked to the husband to change their job to a day job, her obesity completely disappeared. She's actually now of a normal weight. So it's way beyond just medicine. It sometimes becomes a lot more social work. Uh, but nonetheless, it really requires that excellent rapport with people to find out what is the reason that making people have obesity. And unless you leave your prejudice behind the door, then it, it is very difficult. Feet, I will say just one thing. Yes, painful neuropathy is very common and painful neuropathy from diabetes manifests as pain, but not every painful foot in a diabetic or in a patient with diabetes is actually the, uh, diabetic neuropathy. So half the time in my clinic, I basically spend all my time trying to figure out what the diagnosis is because in 50% of the referral I receive with painful feet, the diagnosis is not diabetes. It's important that yes, diabetes can cause lots of things, but it's important not to assume automatically that whatever happened to the patient is must be diabetes, or at least it may not be diabetes on its own. It could be with someone else, uh, something else. So I quite often make diagnoses which are completely undiabetes related in my diabetic neuropathy clinic. But unless I pay the, enough attention to the story and do a proper exam and request the right investigations, then the patient will get the wrong label and they will never respond to that treatment. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you so much, um, Fatouani. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so thank you to all three of our speakers. Um, we now have um, probably a short period for panel discussion. Um, please obviously stay if you can, but if you want to go, that's perfectly fine as well. Um, so I'll ask um, all our speakers to turn their, micro, uh, their videos on, if that's all right, please. And we do have um, one question from the chat, which we'll start on. And whilst we're asking and answering that question, uh, please do put any more questions you want to put to our speakers around anything, I imagine, around diabetes or careers in diabetes or endocrinology, and we'll try and answer them. So the first question is for Amy, and that is how often do insulin pumps need to be refilled? Hello. So we, we usually say every three days. So the person changes the cannula and fills the insulin into the reservoir every three days. Fantastic. Thank you. And while people are thinking of any questions to answer, I will answer. I will ask um, one to... Um, well, there's one question to all of you, really, um, and that's how do you think your um, your roles as a consultant or diabetes specialist nurses will change over the next 10 years? So as, as trainees and medical students go into their careers, what will their career look like 10 years down the line, do you predict? And we'll start with Prof. Tuani. So I think uh, overall, there'll be more emphasis on subspecialty. So yes, uh, the jobs will probably include an element of general medicine because general medicine is always going to be required. 
I can't see the UK being able to completely move away from the general medicine model because the way how the system is structured. And actually, I really think it's, it's, it's a nice part of the system. Um, people probably will become more and more specialized. So people need to think about when they are doing their training, how to develop that subspecialty skill and what is going to may be different to other people when they apply for the job. So uh, my strong advice would be don't be bland. Just don't, be, don't say that I've done everything and I'm competent in everything. Yes, you need to be competent in everything. I am also competent in managing fewer chromocytomas. I just don't see them anymore. But nonetheless, I can still manage them. But that's not what, uh, that's not what I'm doing this job. I've, got, I've, done, I've done this job because I've got specific skill. So build up that specific skill that you can sell very well. It may be more than one skill. But I think what will change over the years is we are all going to become much, much more subspecialized. And obviously, we need to work much closer with primary care as well because that's where most of diabetes care is. Thank you very much. And to our London team. Yeah, I mean, Tim, I, I, I suppose a, a, a few things. I, I mean, technology is going to change the whole landscape. So, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the way we manage type 1 diabetes will be very, very different. So that's going to be fascinating to, to watch and, and be part of. Um, I, I mean, so Ab mentioned a little bit about general medicine. And I, I think that one of my messages to, to anyone who's considering a, a, um, a a career in this specialty is yes there's lots of general medicine but actually it get, gets a little bit easier when you're a consultant because there's very few places that actually where you'll be on on the on the wards all the time so i i spend sort of you know three months a year on the ward and and so the other the rest of the, the year i've got i've got to do other things so it's actually you know whilst being a med reg is is tough it's not forever uh, and once you're a consultant doing general medicine actually it's great fun um you know it's it, I, I mean i i absolutely love uh, uh, the general medicine bit of my job and uh, and i wouldn't change that and the, the 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 majority of jobs will have a component of general medicine but but you'll do uh, some of it uh, at some time intensively and then at other times you'll be able to do your specialty. You're muted. Can I, just can I add a point, sorry. Tim, if you don't oh, mind? Go for it, Abd. Yeah, I just want to say about the word of technology. I, I really think technology is fascinating how it's moving. So even in my field, for example, uh, we, we bring people, for example, to, to receive a special treatment for the diabetic neuropathy in the clinic. What I know for a fact that the company is now moving to a small device that can be connected to a mobile app and the patient will receive the patient treatment at home. They don't need to come to see us anymore. Uh, in sleep apnea research, for example, and sleep apnea diagnostics, I don't actually bring the patients to see me anymore at, at, at all anymore. I'll give them a finger probe, which communicate with their mobile app. And that mobile app will download the data on a website and the patient will just do the sleep study at home through it in the bin and in the morning i'll just click, click into the app and i see everything i want to see it completely transform what we do and, and that's not even you know the really hardcore stuff which i love about type 1 diabetes fabulous is there anything amy you want to add to the future or to technology i think that's pretty much covered, but I think I've seen a lot of changes in 15 years. So I imagine in the next 10 years, there's even going to be more that we're going to have smart insulins, we're going to have different pumps, we're going to have insulin pumps that contain glucagon as well, potentially. Um, and yeah, I think a, a huge amount more devices. Um, so yeah, we'll have to further upskill quite quickly. Um, so. Okay, thank you for that. Aware of the time, I'm hoping our speakers can stay with us for a little bit longer. We've got a couple of questions that have just come through. Um, so the first one is from Jason. So is it true that only IMT3 will be considered for ST3 diabetes endo training next year? Any suggestions for a non-IMT? Um, and I will open that up to anyone or if you're stuck, I can probably answer it as well. I'm a bit stuck with that, Tim. You probably are best place to, to answer that, actually. Okay, so my understanding, Jason, is that yes, it is true, you will need to have done IMT3 or an IMT3 equivalent year, but please check that with the World College, but that is my understanding. I think in terms of suggestions for non-IMT, there are a lot of fellow opportunities out there in London, nationally, internationally, through YDF, and I think SFE try and promote some of those, and a lot of people are doing fellow years and that sort of thing, and you can gain your IMT3 competencies and accreditations during that IMT3 year, but do check all that with the World College of Physicians, but unfortunately it is in a state of flux at the moment. Um, and then the next question is, I am an IMT1, very interested in endocrinology. Are there any tips to improve my CV for specialty training? Do I need to do research prior to applying? And I'll open that up to um, anyone. 
Um, so, uh, I mean, my, my comment to that would be you don't need to, to go and do a research job beforehand, but actually getting something on your CV that shows an interest, so an audit, an abstract, uh, you know, getting someone like uh, 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 Abdurani to, to help you out with a, uh, uh, a project uh, related to endocrinology or diabetes would be very, very useful uh, and would enhance your CV. So you, you certainly don't need to have, have you know, d done an MD beforehand, but actually getting a, maybe a publication, maybe a case report, maybe an abstract, I think that would really enhance your CV uh, significantly. Uh, do you agree, Abd? I totally agree. I will just add to that. Try to go to some clinics if the time allows and your job allows you. Really go to the outpatient clinics. That's where most of the specialty is. Uh, and that can show, you know, that will show how much, in how interested you are. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm going to give 30 seconds for any more questions. And be brave. If you've got a question, pop it on the um, chat now. Um, and we, yeah, we can go from there. Any questions at all? 10 seconds. I feel like an auctioneer. Okay, we'll bring it to a close then. Um, so what I'll say is thank you so much um, to all three of our speakers. Um, that's been fantastic. It's inspired me to do a career that I already do. So that's definitely a tick from me. Um, I hope you've enjoyed um, being here. Um, as I say, do get in touch with the early career and um, endocrinology email there. YDF on Twitter, SFE early career SOC are also on Twitter. So do get in touch with us either via Twitter or our messaging via our websites. Um, and we're very happy to help out in any way we can. Thank you so much. And I think the recording will be made afterwards. And I'll just leave it open to our speakers if there's any last things they want to add before I bring it to a close. I, I would just want to add one word if you don't mind. Uh, I'll just say, it's really never been a better time to actually join diabetes and endocrinology. Uh, when, when, when Prof Chowdhury joined, there were three drugs for diabetes. Uh, uh, now, now we have about 15 of them and the numbers keep increasing forever. Multiple insulin technologies, multiple insulin formulations, and really the field never been any more exciting. We actually now can cure diabetes in a way, although the word cure may not be the right word, at least type 2 diabetes to be precise. And you'll be surprised how much development is happening on the prevention and actually uh, uh, insulin preservation for people with type 1 diabetes as well. So I don't think it can be any more exciting that a lot of these chronic conditions we deal with actually they have now much better treatments than ever. And that treatment landscape keeps expanding as quick as it can be. Thank you. Any final words from London? I'd echo that, uh, Abd. I, the, the only thing I was gonna say is, I did uh, allude to that uh, BMJ article. What I'll do is I'll actually email it to Heather and get Heather to email it out to everyone else uh, uh, um, at the end of the, uh, the, the, the topic, uh, at the end of the uh, talk. But uh, no, absolutely delighted to, to have so many people interested. And if, you know, if, if you want to be in touch with us personally, I'm very happy for, for Heather to share my email. Um, you know, if you want some advice on careers and so on, uh, very happy for you to, to contact us personally. Brilliant. Thank you all. And I'll bring it to a close. Thank you so much.